You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television for you, by you. Hi, Frank Moore here for Life on Gabriola TV. I recently sat down with our two Islands Trust trustees, Toby Elliott and Susan Yates, to discuss the review of our official community plan, as well as the land use bylaws, which is just getting underway. The OCP governs the use of land and other resources on Gabriola, guides our planning as a community, and as Trustee Elliott puts it, enshrines our values. In the interview, we discuss the process that will be undertaken, as well as some of the many issues that will no doubt be raised, including one that you told us you wanted to hear discussed, which is affordable housing. Here's our conversation. So, Toby, maybe you can tell us, uh, what are going to be the different stages in this review, and how long is it going to take? Well, we hope to have the process um, as as um, close to a timeline of two to four years as possible. Some of them have gone on very long. I know Gambier Keats has been undertaking an OCP, I think, for about 10 years for their review. Um, so there's no telling how long it's going to take. But the what we've decided to do with staff is have a slightly longer lead up process, which we're calling this preliminary phase to really set the stage and get everybody comfortable with the idea of what is the OCP? How do we want to um, put in our ideas and suggestions about it? And so this first phase is really important for setting the stage and it's it's called Visioning Gabriola 2050. And that's because we hope that the document that is produced, the new OCP is gonna see us through till 2050. Mm -hmm. So the current one we have, we've been running on for 22 years. 27, I think. 27 years. Since, Since 1997, is that yes. right? But with various amendments along the way, of correct? Course, yeah. yeah. Very small amendments, but essentially it, it's a document that's locked in sort of that time and space from 20 years ago, and some of the policies are not serving us today. So we really need an update. Mm -hmm. So what will be the steps in that process over those two years or so? Um, so the visioning process we're in now is to talk about our vision and values and really bring the community together on some common themes. So uh, we also want to know who lives here now. So it's not a demographic survey, but um, who's interested in having input into our community plan into the future. And we're hoping that young families and um, folks with children also and the thinking of the next generation come out. So that's the vision and values process, which will go until June next year. And then in April, which is the start of our fiscal year, April 2024, we will hopefully have the budget for the full OCP review. And so that kicks off the next stage, phase two, of identifying the priorities, areas that we want to dig into. And so what are those policy areas that we really need to dig into and what's that gonna look like? Right. So Susan, uh, what are you looking for from the Gabriel public at this point as we begin the review process? Ah, we are looking for people to be engaged and interested in what they want to see their community as uh, for the next 50 years. Um, so we want them to be involved in thinking about what is an official community plan. Uh, we want them to we want them to really care about where they live and what this place is going to look and feel like for the next 50 years. Right. So that they so that they are happy being on Gabriel Island. Good. Aren't we all? Yes. Um, now, we mentioned that the last one was done in 1997. Is that correct? The last full review, and that's yeah. when, Susan, you were a trustee. No, no. no just my, my time ended in 1997. I, I noticed that. Now, check that out. <laughs> yeah, I missed that one. <laughs> And a lot, of course, has happened since then, but mainly what's happened since then is our our provincial legislative requirements that we do not have in that old OCP. For example, First Nations engagement yeah, was almost non-existent yes. 30 years ago. Yeah. Climate change, mm -hmm. the effects of climate change on our on our environment and on our human environment as well. Yeah. And housing. Housing wasn't even a worry when I was originally a trustee. It was assumed that anyone who moved here would 
be able to either rent or buy a home. And I just find it heartbreaking that we can no longer assume that that's the case. Yeah. And we need to work on that. Right. Given that change is constant, why so long between uh, reviews? They're extremely expensive. Yeah. Um, for instance, a comparative review in Parksville would cost around $350,000. And we're not budgeting anywhere near that. So we have to rely on a lot of grassroots um, engagement, like Susan says, going out and asking the community and the groups that already exist, how can you contribute towards this vision? And then the research that's already been done by groups like Sustainable Gabriola, the Climate 121212 group, and the Health and Wellness Collaborative on around health and wellness, they've done incredible surveys and already done a lot of that groundwork to assess where are we at today and what does the public want to see in terms of protection for the environment, mitigation of climate change, and active transportation. So I don't think it's going to be hard to pull that information together. We don't need to go out again and keep asking those same questions. So, but we don't have the budget for a big, you know, professional grandstanding sort of community engagement process. It just, it costs time and money and it needs to be the right time and place. Fortunately, mm -hmm. both Susan and I are super committed to this process and we have great staff support. So I really feel this is the perfect time. We couldn't have asked for a better uh, moment for this, for this OCP review to happen. Mm -hmm. And Frank, we are, um, you know, we're just one local trust area in the whole trust area. Mm -hmm. And there are other communities, for example, Salt Spring Island needs a huge OCP yeah. review. And their village area needs a separate one. Um, and it'll be much more expensive than what we're trying to budget for. Mm -hmm. We are asking for $77,000 in this next budget year to, to work on phase basically just phase two of our official community plan update. And we may not get that $77,000, but that's what we need. And that's from Trust Council. So in the budget discussions, all of the, project, the budget cases from the different LTCs, the project priorities that they've identified, they all come together in one pool. And in December, all the, our fellow trustees will look at this draft budget together. And hopefully, Gabriel is, will stay at the top and will go, yes, we absolutely need this. Susan and I will be fervently advocating for that. We will. And so, but but there's, there's still a possibility that if that wasn't approved, then the OCP would not go forward. Is that right? It would go forward in a very slow and lacking capacity kind of way it still will have to go forward yeah. in some way. Yeah. But what will be missing is really, really important. For example, mapping information. Mm -hmm. Without good mapping information, we cannot possibly talk about water supply. Um, we can't talk about sensitive ecosystems that may, re that may need de development permit areas. We can't even talk about proper terrestrial ecosystem mapping. Mm -hmm. um, can you yeah. explain a little bit more what you mean by uh, mapping? So the maps we have now are, they're okay for, let's say, planning subdivisions, but they are not okay, for example, for telling us how much water is actually available for things like, so you want to do a multi-dwelling housing um, set up somewhere. Or an eco-village or, yeah. or some kind of concentrated housing. You have to put it where there might be. And enough. there will be a good water supply. Well, we know, we basically know what groundwater recharge looks like. We do have those maps. Mm -hmm. We also have the saltwater intrusion maps. So we know, for example, places that we should not be putting any more wells anywhere in the, those areas. Yeah. They must have rainwater catchment. We don't but have the water balance. But we don't mapping. have the water balance mapping. Like, and that's where the water is being drawn and used already and where it's already too much for, say, a neighboring aquifer. So we, so the, the bulk of the money that um, we're going to trust council for, $44,000, I believe, is to finish this water balance mapping so that we can understand the needs of the land and the ecosystems and then where to put development and not. Yeah. Right. Susan, you mentioned that uh, in the current community plan, the First Nations, it's acknowledged that yes. uh, they, this has been their uh, territory for a very long time in yeah. the current one. But other than that, it, it seems to be a bit of an afterthought. Mm -hmm. Do you expect that to be a more prominent element in this uh, upcoming It plan? has to be. It yeah. absolutely has to be. I know that Trustee Elliot and I are both 
adamant about First Nations early engagement. So will the Shinanema First Nation be involved in the process? We have been reaching out and the plan is, it's not a public engagement process when we're engaging with First Nations. So mm -hmm. there's staff to staff relationship building that's right. happening and there's LTC to the nation that we're developing. So. Yeah. However, Snanemak is very busy. They have their own community plan development that they've been working on and um, I've been following them on social media and it's going to be up to them to let us know what areas are priority, what they want to give input into or not. And so it isn't an expectation that they would weigh in on all aspects of our community plan. This is, um, we hope one day for a joint, it'd be wonderful to have a joint visioning process, but I don't think we're there yet in terms of relationships. So right. we're still working on those relationships. Right. Mm -hmm. So earlier this year, it was reported in the Sounder that you had identified housing as a priority for the review process. Is that accurate? And is that still the case? Well, I would, so I was chair of the Housing Advisory Planning Commission when we did the whole Gabriel Housing Matters survey through COVID, three public engagements on specifically water, ecosystems protection, and housing, and how to, how are we going to address these three critical needs? Um, the reason we put it as a priority is because that work is recent. We've done the research in community. We don't want to re-engage the community on those same questions. So what we did is we pulled it forward and said, okay, we've got a new HAPC, Housing Advisory Planning Commission. Can you look at the work that was done, the input from the community, and then give us a plan for how we can go forward? And that's going to get folded into the OCP process. So it's only priority in the sense that we just want to build on the work that's been done most recently, but the other ecosystem protect, it's all knit together. You can't talk about ecosystem protection without talking about where to put humans and, and their cars and our bikes and stuff. So you really have to talk about all these things together. Right. So when we knew we would be talking with the two of you about this, we put out onto the, the Facebook boards mm -hmm. uh, a question. What do you want us to ask? And a lot of it was around affordable housing, okay. including one from a, a person who basically said, well, I don't feel a part of the community until I can have housing here mm -hmm. uh, that I know uh, is more or less secure. Mm -hmm. The OCP appears to be largely focused around trying to maintain the rural nature of Gabriola, mm -hmm. but how do we balance the, the desire to do that with this acute need now yeah. for more affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Susan? Well, I just want to comment on on that that person's comment, which I take very seriously, because in order to be involved in your community, to be truly engaged, to be a real part of your community, you have to have a place to live. Yeah. And you have to feel like you're going to have that place to live mm -hmm. for as long as you need it. And I really, that is so important to me. So how do we balance that? You know, it's not I always tell people it's not the numbers per se. It is the effect of what we do to the environment. It is how we live mm -hmm. here. So we could probably triple literally the population of this island if we only could limit our dwelling footprints, if we could limit um, our use on resources and our effect mm -hmm. on resources, and if we place our dwellings and our infrastructure in on Gabriola so that they leave larger tracts of uh, say forests and green space for water retention and for wildlife corridors and for clean air. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate that, you know, even before the Islands Trust was put in place in 1974, a lot of development just occurred kind of willy nilly. And um, it wasn't planned. It wasn't really planned. It was just developer planned, basically. And so it's difficult to to do ideal planning when you already got. Mm -hmm. And we also already have this idea in our head that, well, I'm going to move to a Gulf Island and build a four thousand square foot, you know, home. Yeah. And I, I just, I'm going to be blunt. That is not how you become part of a small community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to that. Point. Uh, it's noted in the uh, current OCP 
that there are uh, quite a few undeveloped half acre lots still. Mm-hmm. Uh, and its bent as a plan is to uh, try to uh, focus development on larger five acre lots. And in fact, it, it urges that the half acre lots, if possible, be consolidated mm-hmm. before development. However, yeah. is that possibly a wrong headed uh, idea given how acute the problem uh, of affordable housing has become on the island. It doesn't make sense to place development where the land cannot support it, nor does it make sense to continue to allow these large lots, which was the original focus of the island's trust. So when you look at the OCPs from that from the 90s, you can literally read the policy is to keep lots large so that you presumably have less disturbance on the land. However, there's no, we don't have tree cutting bylaws. We don't have whole, um, they're called development permit areas to protect a, an ecosystem that has a sensitive um, underlayer and so it would limit development across private property. We have almost none of those protections. So it's up to private landowners to do that. So in the 90s and, and 2000s, as people moved there, development was slow. But as we see migration patterns changing and folks moving here and wanting to build their house quickly, you're going to see the degradation of these large lots. And so consolidating them into continuous large lots is just going to continue the proliferation of single family dwellings. What you want to do is have policies in your OCP that's like an eco village with alternative homes that perhaps is not yet defined by, you know, BC building code, but it's an alternative dwelling that you can then draw from. You can draw this this policy for a zoning on this particular piece of land where it's appropriate. If you don't have those policies in your OCP, you cannot just invent them and you have to go through a whole public hearing process to rezone something. If you've had the conversation ahead of time, we want different types of clustering dwellings where it's appropriate with mitigation measures, such as rainwater harvesting catchment, composting toilets when they become legal, then you can easily draw those down to apply to a lot without going through the whole public process. So that's why the OCP review is important because you put those policies so that flexibility is available when you need it. Yeah, the the current plan. We'll leave it there for now. Watch for part two of my conversation with trustees Elliot and Yates about the official community plan coming up later this week.